What's up everybody? Welcome to Breaking Biotech. Thanks for being with me here today. My name is Matt and if you like the show you can help out by clicking the like or subscribe button. You can also donate using the Patreon link in the description below. And with Patreon there's a variety of different tiers. The $3 tier gives you access to the Discord channel and in there we've got a good group of people where we bounce different biotech ideas off each other to hopefully make some uh, gains in the market. So with that I'm excited to be here because I'm going to be talking about three pretty cool companies. The first story I want to touch on is an update from Orenia, where we heard they got FDA approval for their treatment in lupus nephritis. We're then going to move on to Rhythm, and we heard that they provided an update from the results of semilanotide in their basket of different obesity rare diseases. So we're going to touch on that, and then we're going to finish off the show with a story about 4D molecular technologies. And that is a company who is trying to commercialize a new way of creating AAV vectors for gene therapies. And with that, let's just get right into it. So the first story I want to touch on today is from Orenia Pharmaceuticals. The ticker symbol is AUPH, and they're sitting at a market cap now of around two, $2.1 billion. And what we heard about a week ago is that they received FDA approval for Lupkinus for adult patients with active lupus nephritis. And for those who haven't been following the company too long, they showed really, really powerful phase three data the stock shot up really well, and then it's been kind of slowly selling off into, you know, around the $13, $14 area. And what we heard with this FDA approval is the stock shot up to around 20 bucks, and since then it's trading at around $16 now. I took a position around 13 bucks and then sold most of it at around 18 and now I'm just sitting at around 10 shares in anticipation of the future, and so we'll talk about that right now. But... Basically with this FDA approval, there are a few details. And one was that there was a black box warning, but it was pretty much in line with cyclosporin. So it's not really anything to be concerned about. The other real benefit is that the patent protection is likely until the year 2037. So there were some concerns that the patent protection for Arrhenia in this drug was not gonna last that long. And that could cut into the profits given the fact that they would lose exclusivity after a while. So the other thing we heard is that Orenia set the pricing and they set it at a price of $3,950 for 60 capsules. And then they estimate that the net revenue per patient per year is gonna sit at around $65,000. So I did some quick math here to look at the prevalence of lupus. And in general, there's around 20 to 150 cases per 100,000 people. So in the United States, that works out to around 66,000 to 490,000 in the USA. And I know that's a pretty broad range, but these are the these are the publicly available stats. The corporate presentation of Arrhenia says that around 40% of lupus patients have lupus nephritis, so the actual problems in the kidneys that would benefit from this therapy. So that brings us down to around 26,000 to 198,000 total addressable patients in the USA. So what we have here is an estimated total potential revenue between 1.7 billion to 12.8 billion. Now again, that's a, it's a huge range when there's an order of magnitude in there, but at least there we get a sense of the kind of revenue the company is gonna be able to bring in. Sitting at around a $2 billion market cap, it's definitely on the lower end, even though this is the total addressable market and we know that Arunia isn't gonna be able to penetrate the whole thing. But I think the reason why the stock is kind of depressed is because of the bear narrative in regards to launch concerns. So often with these smaller companies, because they don't have an established sales force, they don't have necessarily those established relationships with either KOLs or doctors in the space, it's difficult for companies that are this small to really ramp up and deliver when it comes to the sales numbers. So the bear narrative is saying that, well, they're gonna really struggle with the launch, therefore, the company should only be expected to do the lower end of their expectation. Now on the bull side, they're saying that, well, Arrhenia could be an M&A contender. And there's reasons to suggest that, given that the risk is so low with this drug now, the data looks good, and it's already FDA approved. So they could be being looked at by larger pharmaceutical companies who already have those established sales and marketing pipelines to just include this into their portfolio of products and start selling it. So I'm not sure what's going to happen. I'm holding on to a relatively small position. I don't know how much I feel like diving into here, given that the launch is going to be complicated, but I could miss out on a, a merger and acquisition deal that could come as well. So 
that's Arrhenia. I think obviously it's very positive for the company and very positive for patients that are suffering with lupus nephritis. But for me, I'm happy with kind of my small position and just seeing what happens with the stock. With that, let's move on to Rhythm Pharmaceuticals, ticker symbol RYTM. And they're sitting at a market cap of around $1.3 billion. And what they announced was positive data from setmelanotide in additional MC4R pathway deficient related obesities. So setmelanotide was recently approved for homozygous recessive mutant obese conditions related to POMC, PCSK1, and leptin receptor. So what that means is that patients that qualify for this need to have a knockout in or a mutation in both copies of the gene, whether it's POMC, PCSK1, or leptin receptor. Now, what we weren't sure of is whether or not semilanotide had an effect in heterozygous patients. And what this is, is patients that have one functional copy of this gene. So if their drug semilanotide could have an effect in heterozygotes, it would significantly expand the patient population that would qualify for treatment with this drug. And with an expanded patient population, obviously the revenues could be substantially higher than what we would expect if it was only the homozygotes. So I talked about the anticipation of this result as being a very big driver for the stock, just given the fact that the additional patients added to the total addressable market would be so substantial. The company looked at a variety of different receptor mutants. They looked at the POMC, PCSK1, and leptin receptor HETs, the ones that I think are the most important, they also looked at SRC1 deficiency and SH2B1 deficiency. And what they did, they took a, a slew of these patients, treated them with setmelanotide, and saw whether or not they had the corresponding improvements in weight loss, which is what you would expect to see with this drug, if it was working. And so what we saw in the traditional POMC, PCSK1, leptin receptor heterozygotes, 12 out of 35 patients, which is 34%, achieved the primary endpoint of greater or equal of 5% weight loss from baseline at three months. The overall reduction was only 3.7%, but in the responders, they lost significantly more weight, closer to around uh, seven to 10%. I don't have it here, but they actually did hit that primary endpoint. Now, the difficult thing here is that it wasn't really clear what made a responder and a non-responder. The subgroups based off of the different mutations they had were relatively equally weighted. So it wasn't clear necessarily why a certain patient would respond and why a certain patient didn't respond. And the fact that only 12 out of 35 did get that response really didn't make the drug look very good in heterozygotes. When it comes to SRC1 deficiency, four out of 13 patients or 30% achieved that primary endpoint of equal or greater than 5% weight loss from baseline at three months. The overall reduction of both the responders and non-responders was again 3.7%. And then for SH2B1 deficiency, 9 out of 17 or 52.9% achieved that primary endpoint of greater or equal to 5% weight loss from baseline at three months. The overall reduction was 3.9%. So with all of this data, I don't think it's great for the company. And the reason for this is that it's hard to see how they can achieve success commercially when it's very difficult for us to know whether or not a patient is going to respond or not. If there was some way of categorizing patients as responders or non-responders, then at least doctors could have something to go into the field with and find patients that could be responsive to setmelanotide when it comes to patients with these specific genotypes. So, it looks like it's gonna be restricted to those that have a homozygous mutation, and for that reason, it limits the patient population. Now, as Rhythm decides to move forward, and it looks like they're gonna have discussions with the FDA on a plan for phase three in the second half of 2021, they might be able to come up with a way of deciding what constitutes a responder and what doesn't constitute a responder. And because that's unknown right now, it's very difficult for us to see the commercial success as a possibility here. A patient's not gonna to wanna to go to a doctor with this genotype and be prescribed a drug that only has maybe a 30% chance of having the desired effect. And related to that is there are a number of existing weight loss drugs that while they don't target the MCR4 pathway like Rhythm does, uh, they still might have an effect in weight loss. And with an average overall reduction of around 3.7%,
I just don't think the risk reward is there for these patients, especially at the price point that Rhythm is setting. So it's for these reasons why I think the company's stock sold off so much. The company was trading close to a $2 billion market cap, then after this data came out, they're trading much closer to around one, 1 $1.3 billion. And really, it's just the fact that it's difficult for investors to see the commercial viability of this product in these specific genotypes that would open up that patient population. So I think it remains to be seen, and there is a chance that Rhythm can come up with a good genotype or a panel of mutations that could suggest a responder versus a non-responder. But until they can come up with something like that, uh, I think it's going to be difficult for them moving forward in this patient population. So for that reason, I'm going to sit on the sidelines with this stock. I think uh, it's still an interesting story, and I'm going to keep an eye on it. But for right now, it's not really an option for me uh, from an investment standpoint. All right. So with that, let's get to the main story for today. And the company is called 4D Molecular Technologies, ticker symbol FDMT. And they had their IPO in late 2020. I believe the first trading date was December 10th, 2020. And today they're trading at around $42 per share, giving them a market cap of around one, $1.1 billion. Now to find these uh, statistics on their net loss, it, I did have to go to their S1. When they release their new earnings reports as we go, these are probably gonna look a lot clearer, but from their S1, their year end 2019 net loss was around $50 million. And their current assets at that point, so at the end of 2019, sat at $52.5 million, with current liabilities at $13 million. Now, according to their corporate presentation, they say that they have an $89 million cash position as of Q3 of 2020, plus the $200 or so million dollars that they received from the IPO. So I think they're sitting pretty good right now at their cash position, assuming that their quarterly loss isn't expanding tremendously. And we should be seeing kind of a report wrapping up 2020 soon, and I'm going to keep an eye out for that. But to talk about the company's goals, they're looking at improving gene therapy with AAVs. So the problem is that in vivo AAV limitations, they often depend on the serotype and the genotype of the virus that you're using to carry the gene that you want to transduce the target cells. So the solution provided by FDMT is they're trying to create synthetic capsid libraries to screen for best AAVs for a particular type of system, organ, or cell type. And they're focusing on ophthalmology, cardiology, and pulmonology. So I'm gonna talk about this in more detail, but I first wanna give an assessment of gene therapy and where we are in 2021. And I'm not gonna to spend too much time on this, but I think it is useful to summarize where we are. And really the gene therapies that exist in 2021 they're centered on AAVs, which stand for adeno-associated viral vectors. Now, there are a number of other types of gene editing platforms, but I specifically want to talk about in vivo gene therapy. So that is, you inject someone with something that is intended to target an organ or a cell type to introduce a new gene that's either replacing a defective gene or knocking out a gene that's overly expressing or something like that. So other gene editing technology exists, and just to list some of those, we've got CRISPR, and I haven't talked much about CRISPR on this show, and I've missed a huge run-up in a lot of the CRISPR stocks, but CRISPR is, is one way of editing the genome, and you can do this in vivo, which a company called CRISPR has been doing. Um, other ways, cell therapy is a really popular one, and we've seen that with CAR-T, CAR-NK, all sorts of other therapies where you take the cells out, edit them, and then put them back in the patient. There's other therapies such as ASO, and a company like Ionis is commercializing that, sRNA as well as mRNA. And mRNA has really come on the scene in light of the COVID epidemic and the vaccines provided by Moderna and Pfizer. Going back a little bit to the adeno-associated vectors, this is really just a means of carrying genomic information into cells. And the ways that these are done otherwise, one is called electroporation. And this is one that's done with cell therapies often, is you'll take the cells out electroporate them, which creates these very large pores in the cells, and it allows genomic material to get in the cell and then do its activity. You can't do this in vivo, unfortunately, it's just an in vitro technique. And then another means, something that Moderna commercialized was this lipid nanoparticle, and they've used this successfully to use their mRNA vaccine. So there are other ways other than adeno-associated viral vectors, but AAVs have a lot of advantages to them. and 
I'm not going to get into all of them, but they are a very viable method of doing gene therapy, and they've been used for quite some time now. So when it comes to talking about what AAVs are, they're composed of two overall parts. One is the serotype, which refers to the capsid, and that basically encloses the genome. And there are multiple different proteins outside in that capsid that determines how effective the toxicity is going to be, the transduction efficiency, and all of those things. Now the genotype refers to the other part of the AAV, and that's the actual genetic material that is to be inserted into the host, and hopefully, if everything goes well, the genome is going to go in there and actually use the cell's machinery to transcribe and then translate the genes that were originally encoded on that genome to then improve whatever condition or target that you're looking to do. So, you know, I've spoken about RGX314, and that is a gene therapy to create an anti-VEGF antibody. And so hopefully transducing the appropriate target cells are gonna have them produce that anti-VEGF antibody and then have it target the appropriate VEGF molecule and improve patient outcomes. So that's kind of the overall goal. So AAVs are around 20 nanometers in size. They're replication defective. They contain linear single-stranded DNA and their genome size is limited to around 4.8 kilobases. And that's an important point, which is that the size of the gene matters tremendously because genes that are very big or proteins that are very big are not really suited for AAVs given the limitation on the size of the genome. Now, an important thing to note here is that the capsid is critical for the initial reaction or interaction between the host and the virus. And this is because motifs that are on the capsid surface are what allow the host cells to interact with it. So for instance, on AAV2, I have written here that they contain heparin sulfate proteoglycan, integrin alpha V beta 3, and FGF1. That's going to allow that capsid to actually uh, attach to the host cell and then begin the chain reaction to transduce that cell. Native AAVs have a tendency to be better at transducing certain cell types and I have examples here, AAV6 has been characterized in lung epithelial cells, whereas AAV8 is better at hepatocytes. But there's significant limitations that remain to the technology that exists today. And that's due to the delivery cell type specificity. So oftentimes these AAVs are only good at one cell type within an organ. Um, there's also limitation of transduction efficiency. So even within that cell type, the AAVs don't necessarily transduce every single cell. And that has implications when we're looking at actual clinical outcomes and the ability to produce whatever protein that is uh, encoded by that genotype. Other limitations include inflammation and toxicity. This is kind of a normal virus that exists and it does have issues with regards to causing an inflammatory reaction. And if those can be minimized, that would be an improvement in the therapy. And then the last thing are related to neutralizing antibodies. So, like we've spoken about in the past with related to vaccines, patients that receive an AAV gene therapy often produce neutralizing antibodies against that AAV. And now, it doesn't usually have an effect on the actual treatment at that time, but what it does mean is that elevated serum antibodies could affect repeat dosing of that therapy or other types of AAV therapies that a patient might want to take. So what we want to do is avoid a response by the adaptive immune system to create neutralizing antibodies so that these gene therapies aren't kind of a one-and-done therapy in case repeat dosing needs to occur. So that's kind of what 4DMT is trying to improve upon in the gene therapy space, and I think there's a real possibility that they could. In terms of actual therapies that are approved right now, I'm going to blow through these because we've already talked about them, but I mentioned quickly about Unicure's Glybera, and that was approved in Europe in 2012 for lipoprotein lipase deficiency, and that therapy took advantage of AAV1. It did not succeed commercially, so they canned the therapy. Avexis got Zolgensma's approval in 2019 to treat spinal muscular atrophy, and that therapy is actually doing quite well right now at $291 million in revenue in Q3 of 2020, and this is an AAV9 to deliver to motor neurons. And just also so that we know that Avexis was bought out by Novartis in 2018 for $8.7 billion. So very substantial price tag on Avexis. Hasn't quite made up for the cost of it yet, but I think it will eventually. 
And then one other company that I haven't spoken about in a while is Spark and their treatment Luxterna, which was approved by the FDA in 2017 to treat Leber congenital amaurosis. And this is an AV2 to deliver to retinal cells. And the revenue in 2018, the entire year, was only $27 million, but the company was bought out by Roche in 2019 for $4.8 billion. So substantial premium being paid to gene therapy companies um, when they're bought out by a larger pharmaceutical company. And just to mention sort of other clinical trials that are ongoing, one popular target for gene therapy companies is hemophilia, and companies include Biomarin, Sangamo, Unicure, as well as Spark. So enter 4D molecular technologies. And so as we got to 4DMT's technology, other companies did kind of look into what's called pseudotype vectors, and that is a mismatch between the serotype and the genotype. And 4DMT has really committed to this by not only doing pseudotype vectors, but doing what they call synthetic serotypes. And what they've done here is created a library of billions of synthetic AAV capsids. They've screened those for the best targets for a given disease. And so they've come up with 40 distinct FDMT AAV capsid libraries that they're then moving on to the sort of IND enabling studies in order to get them in the clinic. And so they've focused on three key areas. One is ophthalmology, the second one is cardiology, and the third one is pulmonology. And now when it comes to the nearest catalysts, the ones that we can expect are for X-linked retinal pigmentosum, and we should see initial data in 2021, followed by Fabry disease, which is a cardiology indication, and we should see data in 2021. So I'm gonna talk about all three of these different types, and we're gonna talk about whether or not there's any data here that we can use off of to make an investment decision. So the first thing I need to touch on is the ophthalmology targets, because those seem to be the most developed in the company, and the name of their AAV, they've, they've dubbed it R100, and they have a nice picture here to show it full of color with peptide insertions and all of this that are seemingly gonna make it a more attractive vector than naturally occurring vectors that say Regenix Bio or Adverum are using. And those are just other gene therapy companies that are commercializing therapies for wet AMD. So seemingly, what 4DMT is trying to do is create a vector that is amenable to intravitreal injection because as it stands right now, gene therapies for the eye are not very good when they're given intravitreally. The transduction efficiency isn't very well and it also exposes the host immune system to the vector causing more antibody reactions and inflammation. What they're doing is trying to commercialize this vector so that they can supersede the need to do something like a subretinal injection, which is a lot more effective at transduction efficiency, even though it's not a preferred method of uh, injection because there's a lot of problems associated with it. So what I'm gonna do now is compare Regenix Bio's RGX314 to R100. And here's some of the data. So the first thing we're gonna touch on is transduction efficiency. And a paper that looked at RGX314 injected subretinally into non-human primates. That's another caveat I should make, is that all of FDMT's data, unfortunately, is only in non-human primates. So there is a lot of risk associated with the company, given that we haven't seen any clinical data yet. But I think it is still valuable to look at that NHP data and compare it to what we know already. So having said that, for transduction efficiency, I wanted to look at the comparison between the studies that Regenix Bio did in NHP and how that compares to what we're seeing today in FDMT. So when it comes to transduction efficiency, we saw that 70% transduction occurred at the photoreceptors and RPE layer at a dose of 10 to the 10 genome copies per eye, and that was with AAV8. And this is the AAV that they actually moved on to and commercialized in the clinic. For AAV2, however, they only got 30% transduction in the PR or RPE layers at a dose of 10 to the power of 10 genome copies per eye. And this figure I pulled from the paper, you can find this here, and I'm going to have the presentation in the notes of the show, so definitely check that out if you want to look at any of the references I have here. So when it comes to the transduction efficiency of R100, we see that they compared R100 to AAV2. And you know, it's not the greatest comparison given that AAV2 was looked at but not really produced commercially by Regenix Bio. So they're kind of padding the control group here a little bit. And we see that in the 
uh, flow cytometry data, I believe that's what we're looking at here, that at a high multiplicity of infection of around 5,000, they see around 70% transduction from the R100 vector compared to only around 30% of AAV2. So AAV2 was actually consistent between the Regenix Bio study and the FDMT study. And then what we're seeing here is pretty even transduction efficiency between R100 and AAV8. One though is done intravitrally, the FDMT vector, whereas RGX314 in this study is given subretinally. And I'll talk about that in a second, but basically we're about on par. The next thing I wanna look at is the comparison between neutralizing antibodies. And I know this is a busy slide, but I'm gonna make it relatively easy. And so what they've looked at in the RGX314 group is a comparison between AAV8, which is all of these subjects, and AAV2, which has these four here. And they did two different doses, 10 to the 10 and 10 to the 11 genome copies, whereas AAV2 were only looking at 10 to the 11. But because AAV2 wasn't moved ahead, I don't think it's super useful. But what we're seeing in all of these different individuals is that at 10 to the 11 and 10 to the 10, we're seeing some induction of neutralizing antibodies. We see titers here of 1 to 80, 1 to 80, and then at 10 to the 11, we're seeing titers of 1 to 320, 1 to 80, and 1 to 80. So we're starting to see this induction of neutralizing antibodies, which is something we want to avoid for the reasons I explained before. AAV2 is even worse than this, where we saw titers of even as high as 1 to 640. So it's not great to see that, and it's something we want to avoid if we can. So has 4DMT been able to approve upon that with their R100 vector? And what we see here is that in two of these trials with non-human primates, they've dosed 30 different eyes intravitrally at doses as high as one times 10 to the power of 12 vector genomes per eye. And what they tell us here is that L spot for the anti-capsid antibodies was negative, and the L spot for the actual transgene was also negative. So this tells us that at the highest doses of R100, we're seeing no induction of anti-capsid or anti-transdene antibodies. This stands aside as a lot better than the existing vectors that are being commercialized today. So for this reason, I think 4DMT does stand aside compared to RGX314. All right, now let's talk about safety. And from the get-go, I have to mention that the process of a subretinal injection just comes with inherent problems. You're literally injecting a fluid underneath the retina so that it's able to create a bit of a retinal detachment with that fluid and then allowing it to transduce the cells. So from the outset, it is a much more intensive procedure. It's an inpatient process, whereas intravitreal injection is not. So there's a lot more going on with that uh, from the outset. Now, as an aside from that, we're also seeing that the study that did RGX314 subretinally they found that there was a foci of inflammatory cells from both AAV2 and AAV8 in certain animals. And what this led to was retinal thinning and loss of the layered retinal structure. And then they conclude from this is that exposure of the retina to high doses of AAV2 or AAV8 and or high levels of GFP can lead to inflammatory changes of the retina that damage it. That's for the RGX314 paper. If we compare that to 4D molecular technologies, we see that at 1 times 10 to the 12 vector genomes per eye, there is no change in clinical pathology, clinical chemistry, growth pathology, or histopathology. They mentioned that there were no adverse findings. So for this, and I think it might have a lot to do with the injection route, uh, there's a substantial difference here. And 4DMT is a lot better when it comes to the safety data and toxicology data now, the one thing I did want to mention is that RGX314, while it's being assessed in phase three for the subretinal injection, it's also being looked at super choroidally. And this is in collaboration with a company called Clearside. And rather than do the subretinal injection, which has a lot of problems associated with it, like I mentioned, they're going to try and do it super choroidally with this special injector that Clearside makes. And in this way, they're able to get high transduction efficiency while minimizing the side effects associated with the subretinal injection. That's what they're saying hypothetically. But one thing I found was data from non-human primates where they actually did a study in a suprachoroidal injection 
uh, environment. So what we have here is a picture from the paper. And what they're mentioning here is that they injected the AAV8 GFP supercroidally, and they didn't make it clear in the study whether or not it was the actual clear side uh, SCS injector, but there is a conflict of interest statement by one of the investigators that said that they worked or were funded by uh, ClearSide. So I wonder what's going on there. But what they did is they injected at 4.75 times 10 to the 11 genome copies per eye. And what they found was around 30% of the retinal flat mount had high expression of GFP. So we're back down to around 30% transduction efficiency. And then they also mentioned that AEV8 serum antibodies were detected at a titer of 1 to 256 and 1 to 512. And this was 21 days after treatment. So they did three monkeys and they found it in two of them. And then they didn't describe any safety data. And I'm not sure whether or not that's a positive or negative thing. But a couple things that stand out here is that the expression of GFP was only in around 30% of cells. And then they've also detected these neutralizing antibodies at a higher level than the subretinal injection. So this is something that does put 4D molecular technologies vector ahead of RGX314. Now, when it comes to actual efficacy of the treatment, and this isn't a very great comparison, but they only did mouse vascular damages, and they tried to see whether or not they could improve the area of subretinal neovascularization when they injected RGX314 subretinally. 4D Molecular Technologies did a similar thing with their non-human primates, where they injected R100 into the intravitreal space of these monkeys or non-human primates, and they assessed whether the, there was a reduction in grade four lesions, so serious lesions in the eye. And so we can see here at both the highest doses that in the RGX314 group, they saw a substantial reduction in neovascularization, which is what you want to see. And then in the 4D molecular technologies experiment, they also saw a total reduction in grade four lesions. So it seems like both therapies are effective here. I wouldn't say that R100 is necessarily better because they're looking at the number of grade four lesions rather than looking at total neovascularization area. So I would say the one is probably a little bit more sensitive at picking up neovascularization area, but overall I think both are kind of on par here. So to conclude this section, I think it's fair to say that the transduction efficiency is relatively similar between subretinal injection of RGX314 and intravitreal injection of R100. Now, intravitreal space injections are usually more susceptible to the immune system response compared to subretinal injections, but R100 showed no immune reaction to date. So that is super positive for them. The transduction efficiency improvements might be negligible in R100, but the improvements in neutralizing antibodies as well as safety or histopathology puts R100 vastly superior than RGX314, at least in this non-human primate model. So I have that written down here as well. Keep in mind that this is all in non-human primates and they are not a totally accurate representation of humans. So it really does remain to be seen whether or not they can reproduce this data in humans. But I think the fact that the safety and neutralizing antibody data are better uh, speaks a lot to the potential that 4D molecular technologies has in the ophthalmology space. Now, having said that, RGX314 is still on track to be the first in class with a subretinal injection, and their suprachoroidal injection is going to follow relatively soon. So I think that does make them an attractive company as well. Furthermore, a company that I haven't talked about very much is Adverum, and they have a product that's following the RGX314 candidate, and it's an intravitreal injection as well, so it has fewer side effects. It's also a different kind of capsid. It's an AV7M8, and they actually mention here that it's engineered by directed evolution, which I believe is something that 4D Molecular Technology says as well. So they're kind of using a synthetic or a pseudotyped capsid for their therapy too. And so far in their non-human primate studies, they have mentioned that there is no induction of gross degenerative retinal structural changes. So 4DMT has an even higher bar, which is to outdo Adverum's ADVM022 in wet AMD. And they're doing a little bit better in terms of safety compared to RGX314. 
and I believe right now they're in phase one slash two. So uh, it remains to be seen, given we are still preclinical, but because they're going to come out with some data relatively soon, and I'm referring to 4D Molecular Technologies, I think that it is an interesting company. So uh, they're looking at four different indications in ophthalmology. We have X-linked renal pigmentosum, and we're going to see some data there in this year. They're looking at choroideremia, which they're saying we should see data in 2022, and then they're initiating a trial in wet AMD, and they're also looking at diabetic retinopathy. So those are going to be the bigger uh, indications, I would say, but if they can see proof of concept data in humans with this initial study in X-linked retinal pigmentosum, I think it could really explode the company. So what I want to move into now is to talk about their cardiology asset in Fabry disease because we're also going to see data from them in 2021. So to talk about Fabry disease, it is a disease where there's a deficiency in an enzyme called alpha-galactosidase A. And it's a relatively rare disease, and it's included in this umbrella of lysosomal storage disorders. And I've talked about some of these. I believe MPS1 and MPS2 are other ones. And what happens is that because this enzyme doesn't exist, the lysosome gets an accumulation of something called glycosphingolipids. And this leads to all sorts of negative consequences. Um, it affects the kidneys, the skin, as well as other organs, but the main cause of death is related to cardiovascular disease. Now, there's about 19,000 total addressable patients in the EU and the USA, and there's around $1.5 billion in annual sales of enzyme replacement therapy, and this is as of 2018. So I'm referring here to ERT sales because ERT is the standard of care right now. And as we've explained before, I think everybody kind of knows this, ERT, enzyme replacement therapy, has a number of drawbacks. Um, you need constant infusions. And for Fabry disease, it's biweekly infusions. And with these infusions, you know, you don't get a very even therapeutic dose. You get these very high peaks of drug concentration in the blood and then these really low troughs. And what that leads to is just ineffective uh, treatment, whereas ideally you want the steady state of drug concentration in the blood so that it can degrade these uh, glycosphingolipids and then prevent the lysosomal storage disorders. So for this reason, the lysosomal storage diseases do make for really good gene therapy candidates, and that's what 4D Molecular Technologies is looking at. So... The other thing I wanted to mention before I look into the data is that Fabry disease is a relatively crowded space. Uh, I mentioned Sangamo already. They have an, an AAV62 gene therapy. It's called ST920. The one thing, though, is that it's liver specific. A company called Amicus, uh, ticker symbol FOLD, has a product called Gallifold, and this is an oral. Uh, compound that's able to treat about 35 to 50 percent of Fabry disease patients. So that's out there right now, and they're also looking at a gene therapy candidate that's still preclinical collaboration with the University of Pennsylvania. Avoro, Avoro Bio, I believe the company's called, has a cell therapy that they're looking to commercialize for Fabry disease, and here they aphorese the cells, edit them, and then put them back into the patient. So a bit of a different type of technology that has its own limitations. And then finally, there's a company called Freeline that uses AV3 to target the liver and introduce the alpha-galactosidase gene there. So it's a relatively crowded space right now. And what 4D Molecular Technologies is looking to do, they're separating themselves against all of these technologies by being able to penetrate into multiple cell types and organs. And here there is actually a room for that, I would say. If Freeline and Sangamo can target the liver, but get the levels to be high enough where they are able to get degradation of the glycosphingolipids in all different kinds of organs, then maybe they don't need this. But if 4DMT is able to get this transduction into all sorts of different cell types, seemingly they could reproduce the healthy human, the healthy normal human, who doesn't have the mutation in this uh, alpha-galactosidase gene. The other thing they're looking to do is a one-time administration, and here I think they're setting themselves aside from uh, Avoro Bio or Gallifold, but seemingly Sangamo and Freeline would also only need one administration, you would hope. And you know this is kind of a limitation of gene therapy, but we don't actually know the durability yet. 
Next thing is that they are touting their therapy as being efficacious despite prior ERT or alpha-galactosidase antibodies. So here again, they're talking about these neutralizing antibodies that might interfere with some of the other therapies. And it still remains to be seen if FDMT can reproduce that in humans, but at least for their ophthalmology, they're able to show this um, improvement in neutralizing antibody uh, induction with their gene therapy. And then 4DMT also says that they can target classic, non-classic, and female populations. And depending on the therapy, they might be better or not at these different types of Fabry disease. So let's look at the data. And again, they're only showing us non-human primate data. That's all there is. But the product is called 4D310. And what we're seeing here on the left is the level of plasma alpha-galactosidase A activity. And on the right is the tissue alpha-galactosidase activity. So what they're showing us here is that at 5 times 10 to the 13 vector genomes per kilogram, they're able to see a massive induction of plasma alpha-galactosidase activity, multiple, multiple fold increases. And what I wanted to point people's direction at is that the normal human blood reference AGA activity range is 7.9 to 16.9 nanomole per hour per mil. And the units are the same here, but you can see here that they're increasing the activity to 10,000. So part of me thinks there's just like a difference in the AGA activity between non-human primate and human, uh, the fact that there's such an induction here. But suffice to say that we're able to see this very large increase in plasma activity of AGA when they're given this novel type of AAV. Then when it comes to tissue activity, this is important to look at too because you need the AGA to actually penetrate organs and actually get into cells to cause the effect that we want of breaking down those glycosphingolipids. So what we're seeing here is that in the heart, in the kidneys, and in the liver, we're getting a multiple fold induction of AGA activity uh, as compared to vehicle, which is what they're showing here. And to give a comparison of this, I wanted to pull up a paper from Gallifold and this is Amicus's oral drug. And what they see here in the kidney, so I'm pointing your attention to the right, what they see here is from baseline, and these are Fabry disease patients, from baseline to week 12 of kidney, they're looking at an induction of around 4.7 to 29.9. And so this is multiple fold increases, and it really is in line, well, for some patients with the data that 4DMT is seeing here. So for kidneys, we're seeing about maybe a fourfold induction compared to the previous data that Amicus has shown where they'll see here that in this patient they see around a fourfold increase. This goes up to around 10, but some other patients are, uh, you know, closer to four. So I think it's in line with what they're seeing in a, a once oral daily treatment that Amicus has developed. But the benefit here would be that it's a gene therapy. So seemingly it would only have to be given once and then there's all these other benefits that come along with it. So that's unfortunately all we have for Fabry disease. And again, we're stuck in non-human primates, so they're not a perfect surrogate for humans, but if 4DMT can replicate this in humans, and this is data that's gonna come out in 2021, I think there is potential here for a major increase in the stock price. So the last model I wanna talk about is cystic fibrosis. And this is the last organ or system that 4DMT is looking to target. And they're looking to treat cystic fibrosis. And to give a bit of background on that disease, it's a genetic disorder in both copies of this gene called cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator. And it is important in regulating ion movement, especially chloride, between a membrane. And so when both copies are mutated, there's significant problems with production of sweat, digestive fluids, and mucus. And what this leads to, more often than not, are problems in the lung, and this is due to a thickness in the mucus. And this leads to clogged airways, as well as increased risks of inflammation and infection due to deficient mucociliary clearance. So the mucus is just so thick that there becomes issues with inflammation and infection, as well as problems with with breathing in general. So it's a very, very debilitating condition. There's 30,000 patients in the USA, and in general, one in 3,500 children are born with cystic fibrosis. And then to give some 
idea of the revenue that can be brought in by this indication is around $4.2 billion in revenue in 2019. And so a recent actually real development in this disease was the approval of what's known as protein modulators, which actually help that protein, whatever's left of it, because oftentimes it's just a deletion in the protein and it's not totally eliminated. But it's a drug called Trichafta, and it's a three different molecules that are given to the patient, and it's particularly effective in the F508 deletion mutation, which happens to be 90% of cystic fibrosis patients. So this drug came on the market, I think only a couple years ago, and it's improved the quality of life of these patients significantly. So there's been big moves in the positive direction with cystic fibrosis, but I think there is still room for improvement there too. The one downside of Trichafta is it's a daily dosing regimen, the efficacy could also be improved. It doesn't necessarily cure the disease, but it does treat it. And then 10% of patients are not treatable. So seemingly, if a gene therapy could come in and put in a proper copy of this CFTR gene, then presumably you could get an improvement in condition and it would treat all the patients. So here's the data that we have from their vector for the lung. And this is the A101 vector. And the specific product for cystic fibrosis is 4 d uh, 710, and this is in non-human primates. And what they're showing us here compared to vehicle is very robust expression of the gene in the trachea, the bronchi, and the alveoli. So it's able to transduce all of these different cell types, which is not always the case when it comes to different gene therapies, but here they're able to see this robust expression. And that's what that brown color is. Uh, the type of stain that they're doing is that brown shows as positive. And then they're quantifying this uh, through reverse transcriptase qPCR or just qPCR looking at the genome as well as the mRNA um, compartment. So we're seeing nice transduction there. There's no real safety data or uh, neutralizing antibody data, but I think it's still early. So it remains to be seen whether or not this can translate to humans, like I mentioned, but I think it is an early step in the right direction. Okay. So the next thing I wanted to do is compare 4D molecular technologies to competitors that are, you know, at the same area or maybe further developed in their pipelines. And for ophthalmology, well, just to reset us here, 4DMT is looking at a $1.1 billion valuation, and they're right now in phase one, especially for X-linked retinal pigmentosum and Fabry disease. Those are the two indications that we're going to see readouts for, you know, any time in 2021. So comparing that to the ophthalmology companies that are out there right now, I've got three listed here, Regenix Bio, Kodiak, and Adverum. Regenix Bio is sitting at $1.7 billion valuation, and they're at phase three. Kodiak's looking at a $6.4 billion valuation, and they're at phase 2B3. And Adverum is a $1.2 billion valuation sitting at phase two. So 4DMT is not that far off from Adverum or Regenix Bio, and they're still only at phase one. So I think there's a bit of a generous valuation going on for 4D molecular technologies right here, specifically looking at ophthalmology. If we look at Fabry disease, Sangamo's sitting at around 1.9 billion, Fold is at 4.9, but that's already a launched product, so I don't think that's necessarily a great candidate. Avoro Bio is 0.6 billion, and Freeline is at 0.6 billion. So here, 4DMT is given a more generous valuation than Freeline and Avoro Bio, even though they're relatively similar at stage of development. And Freeline specifically has other types of cardiology products. So I'm kind of surprised to have seen that, but I think it shows that 4DMT has a lot of excitement behind it, where investors are piling into the stock expecting a very positive result for their early clinical readout. So their valuation is actually more generous than a lot of these companies who are still maybe a little bit further ahead, but don't have as much excitement from investors right now. So then for cystic fibrosis, there were two companies that are public that I particularly wanted to look at. One is an mRNA therapy, and the other one is looking at uh, a gene therapy for cystic fibrosis. ARCT Arcturus is at $1.7 billion and it's still a preclinical stage. And then Riata is at $3.7 billion valuation and they're also preclinical. But these companies have a lot of other therapies out there. So I think most of their valuation isn't due to their cystic fibrosis indication. And then there's other companies that are private right now. So they're not really useful judges of the valuation. Okay. So given all of that, my conclusion for 4D molecular technologies is that it's 
fairly valued given that there's no clinical data presented to date. Improvements in the platform have not yet been realized despite all the investor hype. And I think the IPO price was around like $20 and then it was bought up immensely quick up to like 40 and I think 50 is its 52 week high right now, but it's settled around 42, $43. And I think that it's an ambitious valuation right now given that we haven't seen any data yet in humans. Now, ophthalmology and Fabry disease, in my opinion, make up the largest portion of the market cap today, and they're already valued close or higher than some companies that are further along in development. So phase two or three, like Adverum or Regenix Bio, I think that Adverum at $1.2 billion is, you know, there's a bit of a mismatch in market cap there, or phase one or two with Freeline or Avoro Bio. So the fact that there's already this generous valuation for 40 molecular technologies makes me think that it's fairly valued today until we see what the actual clinical data is. So if it's a wild success and they're able to reproduce the non-human primate data when it comes to safety and toxicity as well as neutralizing antibodies, and then furthermore, if they can actually see that efficacy, but efficacy seems to be a bit more of a given if they can get the transduction efficiency like they've been talking about. So you know, I'm going to be looking at all four of those pillars, transduction efficiency, efficacy, safety, and neutralizing antibodies. So I think those are the things to watch for. And if 40MT can surpass the existing technologies that are in the clinic, I think that they could absolutely get a valuation that surpasses those companies. For that reason, despite the fact that I think it's fairly valued today, I would like to have some exposure to this company because if their platform can be validated, I think that the potential return could be significantly more because people are going to start to value the company as if they're probably going to get good data in wet AMD, diabetic retinopathy, and these are multi-billion dollar indications. So for that reason, I think it's appropriate to have some exposure to the company. Now, one thing that we need to talk about is with companies that have just gone IPO, there's a lockup period for insiders that have owned the company before IPO where they can't trade their stock until this lockup period expires. And for 4D molecular technologies, the lockup period is 180 days after the IPO date. And the IPO was December 10th, 2020. So six months after that puts us at around June of 2021. And then I looked up the number of shares that we're talking about here. And today, the current float, which is the shares that are available for trading on the open market, is around 3.31 million shares. The number of shares that are locked up is 16.8 million shares. So we're looking at five to six times increased number of shares that are going to come on the market and are going to hammer the price down for 4D molecular technologies. So we're in a bit of a bind here because on the one hand, we want exposure to the company so that we don't miss any of these readouts, which they've just told us broadly are going to come in 2021. But we don't want to be holding through this lockup expiration that's going to flood the market with shares and is likely going to depress the price. What I am going to do is I'm going to sit on the sidelines until this lockup expiration occurs. And the reason for that is I find throughout my time in biotech that when a company says that data is going to come in uh, in a time frame, usually it's nearing the end of the time frame that the company decides to release the data. They, they give a very broad range when they don't really know when the data is going to come. And for that reason, they're probably going to give us hints as we go along. So I think when we see their 2020 earnings report come out, there's a good chance that they're going to give us a little bit more specific time frame on when their data is going to come out for X-linked retinal pigmentosum or Fabry disease, which are the two catalysts that we really want to watch for. So for that reason, I'm going to hang out on the sidelines and see what comes out from the earnings reports. And if they happen to tell us that in Q2 of 2021, the data is going to come out, I might take a small position and hope to exit before the lockup expires because I really do want to avoid that catalyst. I think it's going to be very bearish for the stock. Now, once the lockup does expire, I feel more comfortable about taking a position once kind of the bottom has been found. And uh, yeah, then I'll assess the company from there. But that's my overall take on 4D molecular technologies. 
So let me know what you think. Let me know if I'm off base with any of this stuff. Leave a comment below and I'd be happy to uh, discuss further. But with that, I want to move on to a quick portfolio wrap up. And this is as of Friday, January 29th. So it's a little bit dated, but I still think it's useful. Um, I added Cardiff Oncology here, and I'm going to look to exit probably before the data release at the end of February. I added also for this company called Atrika, BCEL is the ticker, I don't know if I'm saying it right, but I might do a video on them to kind of talk about my thesis there. I sold 40 shares of Orenia at 18.5, and I'm still holding on to 10. And then I included my Oncternal position here, which I think is, uh, is going to be a great stock for 2021. So overall, in the last week, I lost a lot in my position. I'm sitting at around 0% for the year. And uh, this compares to ArcG that's still sitting at around 8%. They also lost a lot too. Um, but I think the biotech sector has rebounded a little bit early in this first week of February. So um, not bad, still early days. In terms of the changes in my position weight, uh, Regenix Bio sold off quite a bit. And uh, Trillium still sitting at around 10%. But you can see here my position in Oncternal is sitting at around 6.6 .6, and Arenia is dropped down to around 1% because I'm holding on to very few shares there. So that's uh, all I got for all of you today. So I appreciate all of the attention, appreciate all the subscribers, the likes, you know, tell a friend if you think anybody appreciates this kind of content. I uh, did not talk about GameStop or AMC in this video, but it has been super entertaining to watch. So with that, thanks again, everybody for watching and we'll see you next time.